Greetings, beloved. Welcome to worship uh, at Grace Lutheran Church, wherever you may be watching and however you may be participating in this worship service. I pray that this message finds you well and covered in God's grace. Um, so for uh, our announcements today, I bring a word of thanksgiving to you all from Grace, those of you who were kind enough to offer to send a gift to Pedro Toro, our organist, who is still dealing with the renewal of his visa and is unable to work. He has received the gifts that we, uh, that you have sent him, and he wanted me to thank you all, those of you who sent gifts to him, uh, and tell you how much he appreciated them, uh, how much he misses you, and how much he hopes to see you all at some point in the very near future. Uh, if you have not given a gift to Pedro and you still would like to, you are welcome to do so. Uh, if you would like to make a check out to Pedro Toro and uh, bring it in with your offering or mail it to, to us, the church, uh, or put it through the mail slot, we will continue to send those to him, forward to, those to him as, um, as we receive them. Uh, for this service, we will be remembering our baptism and giving thanks to God for our baptism. If you would like to participate in that, I invite you to take a moment, pause the video either now or just before uh, Thanksgiving for baptism, which will happen right after our welcome and announcements, to gather up a small container of water um, as we go through that uh, part of our service. I want to thank you all for your faithfulness uh, in continuing to support our, our congregation, and as you do so, we are able to continue to support the larger body of the church uh, through our offerings. So thank you for your faithfulness, and uh, as we get nearer towards the fall, uh, the fall season, and hopefully nearer towards an end of the restrictions that prevent us from having worship in our sanctuary, I want to remind you all that we are offering outdoor worship currently on Sunday mornings in our parking lots, or in our parking lot at 9.30 a.m. It is a communion service. Uh, if you do choose to come, we ask you to bring your own chair and a mask and social distance while you are here. And we will continue to do a drive-in communion on the second Sunday of each month at 10.30 a.m. At some point, weather will probably not allow us to remain outside, but hopefully by then we will um, be able to hopefully uh, make it inside our sanctuary on a limited basis with uh, maybe 25% of our capacity. Uh, but we'll get to, when we get to that point, we'll go ahead and make arrangements and let you all know when that is going to happen. Um, but until then, we will continue to uh, offer these recorded services and pray uh, that they do help you to connect, stay connected with each other, and certainly to feel the presence of God uh, in your life and in this world. Next up, Thanksgiving for baptism. We are claimed by God as his children in the waters of our baptism. Let's take a moment to give thanks for that gift. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your Spirit moved over the waters, and by your word, you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. you now to join me in the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, 
you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. The second chapter beginning with the first verse. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's Gospel reading comes to us from St. Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 23. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gives you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, and I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it from human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we find ourselves in Matthew's Gospel after Jesus has entered into Jerusalem. This has happened uh, just a few verses prior to this. Jesus has rode into Jerusalem 
on the back of a young donkey. He has gone into the temple and cleansed the temple, um, left for the evening, and then came back, and he is once again teaching in the temple proper, and obviously with great authority. The impact that Jesus has had on the people of Jerusalem and the people of the Palestine area of Galilee to the north and Jerusalem to the south uh, has been taking place for three years, and he has gathered quite a number of followers and disciples. He has performed many signs and wonders in addition to the teachings uh, that he has done over the years. And he comes in with not a great deal of fanfare, but it says in this gospel that the city was stirred by his presence. And he has become a threat. He has become a threat to the people who were in charge of the temple, the religious authorities of Israel, uh, the Jewish priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and those folks that we know to have been questioning and challenging Jesus's authority since they first heard about him. And they come to him as he is teaching to ask him a question that I believe they know well and true the answer to. They want to know by whose authority Jesus is doing the things that he is doing, cleansing the temple and teaching the way that he is. Where does this authority come from? Well, the reason I believe they know the answer to this question is because of not just the things that Jesus has been saying, but the things that he has been doing. The signs and wonders, if you will, of uh, his authority that give validity, that affirm the things that he is saying, the things that others have said about him, that he is the Son of Man, that he is God in the flesh, that he is truly the Messiah who has come to save the people of this world. He has not just spoken words that affirm that, but backed it up by the many miracles and the fulfillment of prophecy. One of those prophecies that was fulfilled is how he entered into Jerusalem. The Messiah, it was said by the Old Testament prophets, would ride into Jerusalem on the back of a young donkey or colt, and he has done just that. There really couldn't be any greater sign of who Jesus is and the authority by which he does the things that he does than that sign or wonder that Jesus performed so mildly and meekly as he came into this center of religious practice, the center of the religious world for the Jews. But their hearts are hardened. These Pharisees, these religious leaders who challenge Jesus and they refuse to believe those things because, well, it is a threat to them, a threat to their lifestyle, a threat to their authority and their ability to make money, their status in the world. And they're not willing to give that up even for the long-awaited Messiah. The words and the actions that Jesus has been displaying for three years just aren't enough to convince him. But those things have certainly convinced countless numbers of other people, Jews and Gentiles alike, about who Jesus is. Therein lies the threat to the authority of the religious authorities, but it is actions and words together that point to who Jesus is and also who God is and the message that Jesus has been proclaiming, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then we move to this next part of the story where Jesus tells this sort of parable about two different sons and a father who is asking them both to do what the sons would have been expected to do, to work in the family business and go into the vineyard. Maybe not a usual thing. I'm certain as a landowner and a vineyard owner, he probably had slaves, and perhaps he's asking his sons to do something beyond what would normally have been expected of the children of a probably fairly wealthy man. But the responses from the two sons are quite different in word and quite different in action. The one says he's not going to go because, well, huh, like most of us humans that have been corrupted by sin, we have a tendency to want to resist authority and particularly authority of God. 
So he tells his father he's not going to go, but eventually changes his mind because something in him leads him to make that decision to do what he should have done. And then the other son says the right thing, but does just quite the opposite. Again, human nature presenting itself in a way that I think I can certainly relate to, and most likely you can as well. We don't always want to do the right thing, and we often, because again of our brokenness, sometimes, or quite frequently, want to do what we want to do and how we want to do it. Submitting to the authority of another is not always something that is easy or uh, natural for us to do. We have to break through our own independence and our own inclination towards disobedience, particularly toward God, in order to do those things that do bring glory to God. They bring glory to the Father. And that's sort of what Paul was talking about in that second chapter of Philippians. A beautiful hymn of the early church speaking of the nature of who Christ was. How he humbled himself. How he possessed the full power and the authority of God. Yet he chose to lay that down and set it aside to become the servant of all, to live sacrificially, to be obedient to God to the point of death, and not just any death, but the worst possible torturous death of all, death on a cross, to give us an example of how we can and should live our lives. If there was any more powerful sign given to us in scriptures to back up the words of Christ, this is it. We can always point to the cross as the proof to us and to the world of who Jesus is as the Messiah. And by his nature, by his willingness to sacrifice, to set for us an example of how we too can witness to the presence of the kingdom of God. How we ourselves can become that very sign to the world that God is present. That God is love, that God is extending grace to all people, that he is inclusive to all people who come to him to receive that message. But it's not just by word that people can be changed through us as that sign, if you will. There needs to be action behind that as well. Paul writes about that at the end of that in verse 13, saying that we're given power by God through the Holy Spirit to do things that glorify him, to do things. And just as Jesus asked the religious authorities who was obedient to their father, it was the one son who did what he was asked to do, not what he said. So it is by our actions, it is by not just the things that we say, but the things that we do, that miracles can and do happen in this world. Jesus himself said, you will do even greater things than I once I am gone and you have received the Holy Spirit. And I think part of what he was saying there applies to this is that we, the human beings, the broken, sinful people, can resist our selfish nature and do things miraculously to give witness to the presence of God's kingdom in a way that has eternal consequences. And it is not just saying of our faith or proclamation of the gospel, it is the doing of the gospel that makes the difference when they work together. Because if we just say we believe in God, believe in Jesus, that we believe that God is a God of grace and that grace is accessible and available to all, but our actions contradict that, then people aren't going to be changed. They are not going to feel welcomed in the kingdom of God as Jesus would welcome all into his kingdom. And it is an incredible privilege that we are given to be witnesses to that, that we are given the opportunity to be signs and wonders that point to God and his grace and his unending love for all of creation. It is word and deed working together that produces miracles. And how is it that they produce miracles? Well, 
the world that we live in, we know, is not one filled with love and compassion and grace and hope and all of those things. We know that the kingdom of this world presents itself in a much different way. It is divided. It is full of conflict. It is full of war and injustice and oppression and all kinds of other manifestations of sin in our world. And we hear those messages and see those things much more frequently than we do evidence that the kingdom of God is present in our world. But when we, the people of God, can resist the natural inclination to let sin manifest itself in our lives, then that is a miracle. We have gone against our own nature. And when someone is loved unconditionally, who has not traditionally been loved unconditionally by this world, their hearts can be changed as they experience grace. When someone who has been rejected their entire life for who they are or what they look like or where they come from and they experience a welcome and fellowship in a community or by an individual that is uncommon, then a life can be changed because they have resisted the temptation to allow sin to manifest itself in the world. When grace is poured out into people's hearts and lives that don't necessarily deserve it and certainly may not have earned it, the miracles happen over and over again in our world when we become the sign and the wonder of the kingdom of heaven pointing to God, pointing to Christ as a privilege that we don't deserve. And it is only by his grace that we are allowed to do that. Maybe you have experienced something like that. Maybe in your life, You've experienced that through human kindness, compassion, mercy, love, grace, abundance, whatever it might be. And I have a number of times in my life witnessed it in others, but also experienced it in my own life. For years, I heard the things about God in church and participated in them, but didn't ever really experience it in my own life. The wounds that I carried with me from a lifetime of the things that I have experienced had not been healed because I had not experienced what I had heard to be true until I attended a Lutheran Curcio retreat. And for me, acceptance by God, uh, the presence of God, the unconditional love of God I had heard about but had not experienced until through the service and the commitment and the sacrifice of some 60 odd other men uh, uh, offering themselves as a living sacrifice that would allow the Holy Spirit to work in my heart and change my life and to receive that gift of a miracle changed my life. And it is what brought me to the place where I am today as an ordained pastor in the Lutheran Church. And it was something as simple as this Lutheran Curcio retreat that did that. And that is just one of the infinite number of possibilities and examples of how God can work in our hearts, in our lives, when we resist that urge to allow sin to break out of us and instead take the grace that we have received and allow it to pour out into the world around us. Because what we do matters, and I have said that over and over again, and I will continue to say that because I have seen it so many times and I've experienced it myself a number of times. We are the signs and wonders. We are the actual presence of God in the world. We are the light that shines out of us into the world because of our baptism and who God says we are. This miracle that happens in our lives every single day and it happens in the world all around us. Uh, technology being what it is, uh, the recording got cut off right at the end of my sermon. There was probably 30 seconds left or so when it got cut off. Uh, rather than go back and re-record the entire sermon, I'm just going to try to wrap things up as best as I can. Um, we have been given this great privilege uh, to, to bear witness to who God is through our actions and our words. Let us not take that lightly because 
what we are given an opportunity to do is to bring honor and glory to God's name through our very own lives. And there can be nothing greater than we can accomplish in this world than just that, to be the signs and wonders of God's grace and love to the world. Amen.
Let's now go before God, giving him thanks and praise for his abundant blessings and praying for the world he created and which he loves. Let's take a moment just to quiet our spirits and to focus our hearts and our minds on God. Holy and Righteous One, we praise your name. We praise you for your glory. We praise you for your righteousness. God, we praise you for your power and sovereignty over all of creation. You are unmatched in authority. You are unchallenged in your sovereignty. You are unchanging and immovable, God. We give you thanks for the abundance of your blessings. Out of your grace and mercy, you sent your Son to save us from our sins. You are the source of all that is good in our lives and in our world, a source of hope, joy, peace, and strength. Your blessings are priceless, God, and they cannot be purchased. You give so freely out of your grace, love, and mercy that are immeasurable. You truly are a God of abundant blessings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up prayers of intercession for this world that you created and all of living creatures that reside here. For the people of this world dealing with the trials of life that we know we will all face at some point. We trust in the promise of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we will never experience trials alone, that you are present in the midst of all of them. God, I pray that your grace would abound more than the trials that we face, and your glory be revealed to us in the midst of our trials. As we are continuing in a global pandemic, and the challenges that come with all of that, God, we know you are present, and I pray for all who have been impacted by this pandemic, God, and I pray that it would be brought to an end soon. And God, in a world where justice is not as common as it should be, you have raised up leaders to speak out against injustice. May their voices be heard and may they persevere through the challenges that we all face in the midst of injustice. For the individuals facing their own trials, medical issues, grief, homelessness, mental illness, depression, addiction, whatever it is that we face in this world, you have overcome this world, and through you we can overcome our challenges and trials. I pray, God, for healing and hope and peace for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, I give you thanks for the call that we all have as the members of the body of Christ, individually and collectively. And I give you thanks for the church, which brings witness to the presence of your kingdom. Strengthen the leaders of our churches, our bishops and our pastors. Inspire the lay people in our congregations throughout the world that we may bring a more powerful witness to the presence of your kingdom by the ways in which we love you, one another, and our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, for those unspoken prayers for all of creation, for this world that you created and that you dearly love, we lift up those unspoken prayers, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.